Hey everyone, Mont here, and today I'm going to be sharing my startup file for Blender. In this video, I'm just going to be quickly going over a lot of the things that you can expect to see in this Blend file. Feel free to download it, feel free to use it whatever way you want, whether that's for assets, or just taking a look at different details and stuff that I've been using. Otherwise, I'm going to give a quick rundown of everything in this file, and yeah, just show you guys how to use different things within this file. Quick disclaimer, this may be updated in the future, so I may add or remove things, but I have also removed a few things that are a little more private. But otherwise, let's kind of get into what's in this file. So, right off the bat, you'll be introduced with this file once you download it. If you want to use this as your default file, what you want to do is as soon as you download it, open the file, then go to File, Defaults, Save Startup File, and then Save Startup File. And what will now happen is every time you go File, you in general, what they will actually do is that will open up the default file. Now, a few quick mentions, once you actually import a map, if you're importing a map, uh, definitely try and import it into the map collection if you can, but once that's done and you select it and you have MC prep and you prep it, what you can actually do here is right in this window here off the bat there is the text editor, if it's not there then it's right here, but what you can do is there's this remove specular script. Once your map is in the file, what you can do is actually click this and it will remove any specular off your Minecraft blocks. Now, you may want to keep this, this is a bit more of a stylized preference. Typically for Minecraft stuff, specular can make everything look a little white. Otherwise, over here to the right, we've got our scene collection. Feel free to change this up, this is just my general setting. I like to lead off with a map, which you import your map objects into. If you ever have any set extensions, you can put that in the set extension collection just below. If you want to then put, say, leaves and grass into this collection by separating it and putting it in here. And then what you can do is you can just hide that to help save on space and optimize your scene file. And we've got characters. Um, feel free to name these whatever characters these are. So for example, just go here and go Steve. And same again with background. So just if you have any loops or something in the background, just can add them into this collection. For lighting, I've got a few things here that I know I will nearly always or quite often use. So you've got a sun for any kind of outdoor scenes, just set to a decent strength and kind of more like a kind of midday, early day kind of color and strength. One extra thing I've actually included is a kind of tracking light. What you do if you click on this light, go into object constraints. There's a copy location constraint here. And what it does is once you target, for example, a rig, and have it set to, I would suggest the flip bone or the torso. What that now does is this object tracks the torso, but you can still rotate this object. And now whenever you move the character, this item always tracks it. Even if, for example, the character is rotating, this object is just stuck to the character. And if you ever wanted to move, you just select again the empty, the hold empty, and then you can rotate it around if you want. Now I find this is very useful for shots where a character is moving around a lot. So particularly if someone's running, you can see that a lot in the first dragon egg where everyone is running but they're still pretty well lit because the lights are literally attached to the character as they kind of move along. Uh, secondly, these are hidden by default so if you want to use them, make sure you make them visible to both the viewport and the render. But what these are, if I add a plane to show you guys real quick, is instead of just adding a normal spot or area lamp, it actually adds kind of more speckled slash noisy light. So if I kind of move that a lot closer, it's not the easiest to see here, but it's not just it's not just a light at full strength like what this would be. It's adding kind of noise into it. So if I hide this one just so I can show this a little better, move that up and then turn the power up. You have a light that is more noisy and the noise moves over time. Again, a little hard to see, you may need to look at this yourself, but this moves very slightly over time. Um, but quickly going over how these work, you got the noise texture, which is animated by this W. The first color ramp controls the color using this final anchor point here. So say if you want blue light, you can change that to blue. And this black is essentially just saying that the light is off. So if you want to drag this way back further, it's basically saying that this area lamp is pretty close to just being entirely on now. But if you drag it the other way, you can start to see it brings the noise more into play. The color ramp below this is 
basically just adding a little more detail and a little bit of a different color into it. If you don't want that, you can actually just turn this factor down to zero, but it is a very subtle change. If you want to see it kind of more in effect, you can also just type in here, click say, you know, five or whatever, and then you'll kind of really start to see the difference. Yep, same thing then again with the spotlight, of course, except this one's of course a little more contained since it's a spotlight. Um, but these both work very well for lighting environments or smaller areas. You may not need it for lighting characters, feel free to though. But again, if you're not using them, just hide them away and or delete them and yeah, you should be good. So let's delete that and move on. In terms of effects, we only really have a few effects in here. We have a drifting particle, which would be good for cave ambience or just light embers. Uh, we also have energy particles and you can adjust the color using this color ramp here. And it's the same across all three. If you look at the black and white color ramp, this affects the on and off. White being it is completely transparent and black being it is completely visible. And the same applies to all of these three. I've also provided just a random lamp and torch here since I do find I use these quite a bit. For the torch, it also has a simple particle system set up. The Black Plasma V4 rig is included. If you don't want to use this, you can of course use a different rig by just deleting this one and importing your rig. If you ever want to add any loops, then we've got a loop collection for that. Camera, of course. Depth control just controls what the focus point of the depth of field is. Um, if we click on the camera, for example, we can actually see what the depth of field is under the camera settings, under depth of field. If you don't want it on at all, you can just disable that. And for wind control, that's say if you ever want, want to add any like vegetation wiggle or just wiggle to anything for displacement. Quick rundown of the world nodes. If we go over into material mode or render mode and just to make sure that it's visible, click on the little shading thing and bring in the scene world. We can now see that we also have a bit of a default world system. If we go over into the shading editor, change it from object to world, we can see there's quite a few nodes here. I'll quickly explain this. You can honestly delete most of these if you don't need it. But each of these groups here is an individual HDRO and what you can do is using these colored nodes here you can actually control the factor to switch between different HDRIs. So if you ever want to switch between multiple ones all you have to do is go to the image node here, exit out these ones and add the HDRIs that you want and then you can change for example from day to sunset drag this across. I may not actually be able to include these when I release the file, so you may end up having to upload your own, but we'll see. Uh, the rest of these nodes, honestly, you probably don't massively need. Some of these just add little extra things either below the map to add like reflection or to add a kind of like little cloudy kind of smog glow layer on the horizon line. And just to quickly troubleshoot, if you change one, say you want to change a top one and for some reason it's not changing, just make sure to check that these factors are in the right place. A factor of zero will prioritize what's going into A. A factor of one will take the secondary input of B. So just make sure to check that if your HDRI isn't showing up. Additionally, there are these little extra nodes here with a noise texture. If you want to connect the color into the factor and instead control the factor using the noise, you can actually have it so that the noise now controls the transition between the two. So for example, if you want to bring some clouds in over time, I hooked this into the full overcast one. And now I can just bring these clouds in over time, as opposed to just clicking and dragging this and transitioning between multiple. And last but not least, we have the mist. Just click on this little scene thing here, go from render layer to mist layer. And what this does is it takes you to a collection where it's only, let me hide that, where it's only the mist collections visible. Now there are two here, you can experiment with both of these if you want. What this is, a mist sphere, is essentially adding colour to your mist, which then plays on the compositing, which I'll go into in a bit. Um, but there are two different mist spheres here that you can play around with. This is probably the main that one you'll use, but there is also a kind of more streaky one over here, which works probably better for, say, more a more stylized, maybe even rainy sequence. So quickly running through these node setups, the horizontal color is the main one that you are going to touch, especially the color ramp here. What this does is it changes the color from one side of the horizon to the other side. What you can do if you ever want to change the colors, you can drag these around or straight up click on the thing down here and change the color, for example, to whatever you want it to be. 
Now as an added option, as you saw before, what you can actually do is if you grab this node, it will be on by default. But with this set to zero, what this does is it adds an extra ban on the horizon line. And this vertical color, since it goes from up to down, is what controls that. If you want to make this band bigger, you can come down to this color ramp and change this. Again, black being on, white being off. But yeah, this little band just adds a little more option to, say, have a little bit more of like horizon color. In addition, if, for example, you want to add more mist in the sky instead of having that black, or if you want to make the lower down black, that is what this ramp does. So if you want to add more mist, you just drag these up, for example. And then if you want to add black down below you could say click on one of these add an extra anchor point drag it back and set that to white so now that's clear down below and finally there is this day night setting where if you drag this from zero to one it now prioritizes these night slash rain nodes so where the mist is a lot lower down again it's just a nice easy setting to kind of do for that time of day if you ever want to make the mist move a lot quicker because if i press play you can see it moves very slightly Click on this first mapping node. Some frames should show up under the mapping. Just click that, drag them closer to each other. And now it will move a lot quicker. Once you've done that as well, you may want to lock these as well. Just make sure you don't accidentally select them and then delete them for some reason whenever you're doing like a mass delete. So you just lock those. Same with anything really. If you know you're not going to touch it again, just lock them. And when you go to delete it, it won't touch them. So you're all good. Now what this does, is if we now go over to compositing, when we render, we render out two separate scenes. We render out what we see in the render viewport, which will be your map and your characters. Make sure the mist collection is hidden in this layer. Then go to the mist layer. Make sure only the mist layer is visible here. And it will render these two layers out separately. And what it will do in the compositing is this separate mist layer here is thrown into the color that affects the mist past. Now here overall it's just basically all the compositing. I'm not really going to give a rundown of exactly how this works. Matt 20 makes the revamp tutorial series will probably cover this a lot more. Uh, the, the vector blur node down here you may not need. However if you don't want to use motion blur here which basically works the exact same anyway where you keyframe the shutter to zero on a camera cut this works exactly the same if you just drag that up and then you keyframe this blur value to zero on any camera cuts and then have it at you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. I would suggest against that personally, I would just use the motion blur and keyframing this to zero. For the mist as well, if you want the mist to be a lot more dense, then you can increase or decrease the size of this mist amount. If you want to ever increase the distance or the depth of the mist, the first thing you want to do is go to your world settings check the depth mist pass make sure that is high enough you may want to experiment a bit with this this for me is set to linear however to give a quadratic effect what i actually have here is a color ramp additionally allows you to play a little more manually with the depth by using different anchor points and dragging them around but this just gives you a little more control of the depth of the mist. So once you're done with all the mist stuff, then you can go out of the mist layer by just clicking back on the scene setting up here and changing it back to render layer. Now quickly running through blender settings, feel free to change these as much as you want. These are just my simple sample settings. You can lower this or higher it however much you need. 100 should suit a lot of Minecraft stuff. For light paths, I've set the transparent bounces way up, um, but I've also found if it's set way too low, if there are a lot of transparent objects in front of another, what it will do is it'll start to create a lot of kind of like black artifacts and stuff behind it. I definitely recommend doing this, but you don't have to, but you can enable simplify, which is essentially just saying that if set to zero, there are no subdivisions going on in your scene. This helps if you have a lot of objects or rigs that have subdivisions on it. Motion blur, as I mentioned before, I definitely recommend using that, but otherwise you can use the vector blur node. And the rest you may not touch too much. By default, I like to use standard above filmic, which is filmic is the default. However, for Minecraft standard does tend to give better colors. Under render properties, this may change a lot for you. You can change your resolution and make sure to of course set your frame output. I definitely suggest turning off overwrite, which I think is default. So quick troubleshooting, scrolling down to performance. If you're ever finding that Blender's crashing a lot or something during rendering, 
Under performance, you can try either turning on or off fuse tiling or dramatically re reduce this down to say like 64 or 128. This may not make a lot of difference, but something to suggest. Again, like I mentioned, if anything is not showing up in render mode, make sure to check both the viewport and the render mode visibility. If you can't see all of these, if you come up to the flask, you can check them by clicking on these. So for example, if it looks like that, go up to flask, check viewport, check render, and now you should be able to see them. Now for the viewport, a few quick rundown of a few things. For me, I typically wouldn't recommend just staying in solid mode while animating. The way that I have my solid mode set up is on texture, you can enable cavity, and I have outline. You can however change these up if you say think it's a little too bright, we don't like the cavity or the outline. Up the top we also have a few different workstations. This is the main one that I normally use. I have default 3D viewport which is just primarily more for the 3D. Compositing, check your compositing and your render down here. Video editing if you do a lot of video editing and rendering just for watching things render essentially. But if you ever want to add any more just click the plus and add appropriately. Yeah, that covers most of the basics. Feel free to use this however you want. I don't expect any credit for this, especially considering I didn't make a large majority of this stuff. It's just assets that are kind of amongst the, the crew and things that I've kind of gradually obtained or made over time. But yeah, feel free to use it however you want. If you want a startup file or if you want to make a startup file, I would definitely recommend it. And yeah, feel free to use this as like a format. Again, make sure when if you make any changes ever, make sure to go back to file, default, save startup file. Then once you've done that, again, when you go file, new general, it will load up whatever that default file is. So it's a very useful feature. But if any of the assets are also very useful here, like the speckled spotlights and area lights, for example, or any of the particles, then yeah, feel free to let me know. If you feel there's anything I can add, feel free to let me know. Um, otherwise, yeah, feel free to do this what you want and enjoy your days and I will see you next time. Bye.